Senator Delfon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At the outset, I'd like to thank Senator Clément for having taken up the torch previously carried by Senators Jaffer and Pate, who have been proposing the abolition of all ma mandatory minimum sentences for several years. They are not the only ones to advocate for this. Indeed, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, chaired by our former colleague, the Honourable Murray Sinclair, made a number of recommendations in 2015, something similar to what is proposed by Senator Clément, on the premise that the application of these sentences has in fact resulted in the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in provincial and federal prisons. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indig Indigenous Women and Girls, which our colleague Senator Odette participated in, also made a call asking on the federal, provincial and territorial governments to thoroughly evaluate the impact of mandatory minimum sentences as it relates to the sentencing and over-incarceration of Indigenous women, girls, and others to take appropriate action to address their over-incarceration. The Black Caucus of Parliamentarians, which includes Senators Bernard, Clément, Gerba, Meiji, and Moody, recommends the elimination of mandatory minimum sentences since they have resulted in the over-representation of racialized groups in prisons and jails. This is a position of the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers. These are all important messages by credible people that any government would be wrong to ignore. The current government has chosen not to repeal all mandatory minimum sentences but has put forward three targeted measures. Nowhere in the mandate letter to the Minister of Justice was there a mention that he should eliminate all mandatory minimum sentences, but rather that he should reduce the use of these sentences and develop a justice strategy for Indigenous people and another one for Canadians of colour. These targeted measures included in C5 are the following. One, the abolition of mandatory min minimum sentences under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So they were for one year, 18 months, two years, or three years, based on the offense. A number of them have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the Neuer decision or by courts in Alberta, British Columbia, and Quebec, their courts of appeal. The jurisprudence isn't quite clear at other levels where they can't declare things unconstitutional. The repeal of about 15 mandatory minimum sentences in the criminal code for specific offenses related to overrepresentation in prisons and penitentiaries of black and indigenous people, and third measure, the repeal of most of the, of the exclusions from access to community sentences, also known as conditional sentences. These measures will expand the sentencing options available to judges, including shorter than minimum sentences and more sentences to be served in the community. The department expects this to significantly reduce the incarceration rate of Indigenous and Black people found guilty. However, only the experience after a few years will, will be able to indicate if this is the case. Eliminate all mandatory minimum penalties, also called MMPs. The amendment now before us will maintain the majority of MMPs, but will add the provision authorizing judges not to apply them on a case-by-case -case basis. Such a provision is called a safety valve by some and or an escape clause by others. At the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, Senator Pate proposed an escape clause that will have allowed judges not to apply any remaining MMPs, including in case of first and second degree murder, if the judge was satisfied that doing so will be in the interest of justice.
A debate followed, and this amendment was defeated by a vote of 9 to 4. The escape clause now before us is different. It will be applicable only in exceptional circumstances, a higher standard to meet. As mentioned by Senator Clément, this is the threshold applied by the judges in England and Wales to justify the imposition of an imprisonment term lesser than the applicable MMP. As committee, a leading expert in sentencing, a Canadian incidentally, Professor Julian Roberts of the University of Oxford, described this threshold as the highest one. With that context in mind, let me add that the Supreme Court of Canada considers that it's, it is not only legal, but legitimate for Parliament in considering sentencing policy options to enact MMPs to in order to send a powerful message of deterrence and denunciation. Previous governments have all enacted some MMPs, going back, incidentally, to Prime Minister Trudeau. However, the court said that when Parliament decides to enact MMP, MMP, it should act carefully to avoid casting too wide a net that could result in a breach of Section 12 of the Charter of Rights that protect all Canadians against cruel punishment, punishments. In the recent unanimous decision of the Supreme Court in Bissonnette, released in May of this year, the Supreme Court stated that an MMP is cruel only if it results, in some cases, in a punishment which is, a gro which is grossly disproportionate in effect to what would have been appropriate otherwise. That said, for the Supreme Court, an, M an MMP of 25 years, further to a conviction for a first-degree murder, is not a cruel punishment. Incidentally, in Lloyd, another judgment of the Supreme Court released in 2016, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin said that to avoid constitutional challenges to MMPs that cast a wide net, Parliament should consider narrowing the reach so that they only catch offenders that merit the mandatory minimum sentences. She added that another option will be for Parliament to establish a safety valve that will allow judges to exempt outliers from whom the MMP will constitute a cruel punishment. She went on to say that this residual discretion is usually confined in other countries to exceptional cases and may require the judge to give reasons justifying departing from MMP in a prescribed by the law. This is what Senator Clément is now proposing. With all this in mind, let me explain why I cannot support this new attempt to introduce in Bill C-5 an escape clause. First, the proposed escape clause is drafted to apply to all remaining MMPs, including first-degree murder, second-degree murder, high treason, crimes against humanity, impaired driving, bringing death, and child sexual offenses. To me, MMPs are fully justified in such cases to send a powerful message of deterrence and denunciation. Incidentally, in the UK, the escape clause does not apply to all kinds of murders. Here in Canada, in 2013, the criminal sections of the Uniform Law Conference of Canada, a working group including prosecutors, defense lawyers, academics, and others, did not recommend removing MMPs for murders. Nor did the Canadian Bar Association, who appeared before our Senate committee. By adopting the proposed amendment, assuming it is within the scope of the bill, which I also doubt, for the reasons mentioned by Senator Carter Tuesday, we will go further than any country in the world. I'm not prepared to do that. And I don't think such a change will reflect Canadian society's values.
Second, the opportunity of adding such an escape clause at third reading and thus returning Bill C-5 to the House of Commons instead of sending it to read the whole for royal assent relies on the assumption that it will significantly reduce the frequency of imposition of MMPs by Canadian judges. However, the evidence before the Senate committee is to the contrary. In a written answer to my questions at committee, Professor Roberts wrote that such an escape clause in England, because of its very high threshold, has been narrowly interpreted by the courts in England and Wales and used by sentencing judges only in a small, sorry, has been used by sentencing judges in only a very small number of cases. Third, so this is not a change that's going to bring a lot of significant changes. Third, many witnesses have argued against the adoption of an escape provision, whatever its content, because they fear that the systemic discrimination that exists towards racialized, indigenous, and vulnerable people will not result in fewer MMPs imposed on these groups by the justice system. In fact, they fear that such an escape clause will tend to benefit white offenders and those with, with privileged access to legal representation, resulting in new inequalities. This concerns make sense if you assume that the overrepresentation of indigenous and racialized people in our jails is due to over-policing, overcharging, poor access to adequate defense counsels and bias in the court system. Fourth, some witnesses pointed out that contrary to the UK, where there is no constitutional authority for judges to declare a cruel sentence to be unconstitutional, in Canada we have section 12 of the Charter of Rights. In cases where an NMP may result in a breach of section 12 or section 15, the equality right, Canadian judges can declare it unconstitutional and thus invalid. And such invalidity will apply to all persons charged exposed to that MMP, not on a one case by case basis. As indicated previously, to avoid constitutional challenges, Parliament had two options to draft individual offenses and penalties properly, or to add an escape clause applicable in exceptional circumstances. In other words, the adoption of the proposed escape clause will provide a shield against attack pursuant to Section 12 of the Charter of Rights and may encourage future Parliament to adopt more MMPs with the safety valve being possible, contrary to the very goal that is pursued by the proponents of the amendment. Finally, I want to mention that the Minister of Justice and the NDP Justice Critic, MP Randall Garrison, have publicly, have been publicly urging the Senate to adopt Bill C-5 as soon as possible, since it will immediately broaden the ability of judges to render conditional sentences when more appropriate than imprisonment in provincial jail. Most witnesses before our committee support that broadening of judicial discretion. Further to the recent Sharma decision, the Criminal Lawyers Association, the Canadian Bar Association, and the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, and many scholars and other stakeholders have written to us and on the social media, urging us to adopt Bill C-5 without any further delay. I don't see in the reasons that are being exposed to justify the amendment a justification to remain deaf to these calls. For all these reasons, colleagues, I invite you to vote against this amendment. Thank you. Miigwech.